Okay, we begin with this question. How can we be well prepared for meeting Jesus in the clouds? Because for 2,000 years now, we've been given in Scripture the message that when Jesus comes, he'll come in the clouds with the angels on white horses, and the dead in Christ will rise first and meet him in the clouds, and those still living will rise second and meet him in the clouds, and essentially at the meeting in the clouds we'll all have spirit being bodies instead of these old tired ones we have now. Right, so it's much to look forward to. Paul points us to the awesome meeting in the clouds in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, savor that moment for a second. When the first person set foot on the moon, do you suppose they were elated? Do you suppose they were very, very excited to still be alive? and stepping on to the moon that for 6,000 years of history, people have looked up and said, oh, it's made of green cheese, or what is it, or how far away is it? And that guy set foot on the moon just a couple of weeks ago, a week or so ago, the last man to walk on the moon died. You know, now to humans, some humans, not me, but other humans, it's really, really exciting to step onto the moon. For me, no thanks, I like air conditioning. <laughs> You know, so, but think about this moment when you meet face to face with Jesus Christ in the clouds, you've got your spirit being body, you never have to worry about eating, drinking, sleeping, pain, you know, you are an eternal being in the family of God, you see the Father, you see the Son, you see all your friends who've been faithful throughout the church eras, and, and I don't know if it can get any better than that, maybe somebody will hand you a beer and you can get a little better, but whatever. <laughs> will you drink beer when you're a spirit being? I don't know. Maybe you will. Whatever. So Jesus and the Father work every day to prepare and upgrade their faithful servants. They want us to learn a little more, learn a little more. That's what Sabbath is about. That's what Bible study is about. That's what prayer is about, to learn a little more as we go along to keep us faithful until the finish. One glorious Bible verse shows us how our Father in heaven yearns for us to join them in their eternal family. I love this verse, Luke 12, 32. Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, church members, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. One time Jesus, John said, can I, can I call down fire and kill all the people in this village for you? And Jesus Jesus was horrified and he said, John, John, you don't know what spirit we're of. We came to save people, not to destroy people. John, and John learned a good lesson that day. So in three and a half years on earth, Jesus gave three major pep talks to all his faithful servants who could read those pep talks then for the next 2,000 years to prepare faithful and wise servants for the kingdom. Pep talk number one is found in Luke 12. Before we go to Luke 12, we need to grasp the two servant types that will meet Jesus in the clouds. I don't know if you've heard this before, but essentially there are two types of servants of Christ that will meet him in the crowd. Now I'm not talking about the dead and those still alive. I'm talking about the saints who faced normal lifetime deception and then they died before the tribulation. Chester, a good friend of Wilson and Sherry and mine, he, you know, he had sugar diabetes, he was getting old and slow and they found him, <clears throat> he'd worked that day, he'd come home, they found his body lying dead near his air conditioner. So presumably he came in from a long day's work, he was hot and tired, and he just collapsed and died. And that morning when he got up to go to work, he did not know that was his last day. And so, so the two kinds that meet Jesus in the air are the dead who died before the tribulation. And you can probably think of a lot of people who've been in God's church who are now dead and, and so the second kind is the saints 
that are going to face the super powerful deception during the tribulation. Now we have deception all the way around us. Turn on the TV and instantly you see deception. Mankind is 99.999% soaked and saturated with deception. Even the good, nice people still don't know how to love Jesus. And he said plainly, if you're going to love me, keep my commandments. Oh, that's confusing. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> it's simple. Keep the commandments if you want to love Jesus. So Paul and John show supercharged deception is coming. In 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the coming of the lawless one, i.e., 666, the beast, the king of the north, number three, the son of perdition, he has many names, is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, most, very little lying wonders are happening as far as miraculousness, as far as the false prophet calling down fire from heaven, that's not happening yet. When that happens, what do you think most global people will think when a religious man says, Oh God, send fire down from heaven, and fire comes down. What do you suppose most people will do? They'll go, Oh, that's of God. What will you do? You better know your scriptures, and you better go, God said this was going to happen. This is not God. Because he'll be saying that the beast is Christ. And we've been told, until you see Christ coming on a white horse in the clouds, he hasn't come yet. It's a fake Christ that's come ahead of time. In Revelation 13, 14, the false he, the false prophet, deceives those who dwell on earth. They're already deceived, right? But this is going to be lying wonders and miracles and super powerful deception dwell, you know, to deceive those on earth by signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those on earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword. So it really means he died and then he came back to life, which is a miracle in itself, right? Which makes him a superhero. And so they make an image. What does the Bible, what does the Ten Commandments say about making an image and worshipping it? Don't do it. Oh, but then things will be different. No, things won't be different. It'll be the fake Christ, a fake beast, It'll be a fake system, and Christ won't have come on the white horse, so reject it. Jesus wants us prepared against this supercharged deception that's coming. In Mark 13, 22, for false Christ, this is a very interesting verse. I wrote it in the, in the handout for you. Um, false Christ and, notice the word and, false prophets shall arise and, notice that second word and, shall show signs and, the third word, and, wonders, to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. And if you notice, the word even is the same number as the three ands. The translators said, we've got and number one, and number two, and number three, and here's and number four. Let's change and number four to even. Now, whichever way you want to read it, if you read it, and the elect, do you know, raise your hand if you know of any elect Church of God member who's already been deceived. Back in, back in the worldwide days, there were no miracles. Herbert did no miracles, Ted did no miracles, public miracles, and the new uh, pastor general who said you don't have to keep the Sabbath and you can, you can eat shrimp and stuff, he did no miracles. He just said, I'm Pastor General, you can eat shrimp. And a whole bunch of people fell away, even the elect of that day. So there were no great miracles at that time, and yet they fell away. Paul said, you know, they'll turn their ears from the truth unto fables. You know, he knew this was going to happen. In another place, he said the great falling away. So Jesus told us that some baptized members would become unfruitful and fall away. Mark 4, 18 said, These are the ones sown amongst the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. Verse 19, And the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things. We live in a world 
where every TV commercial is almost a desire for other things. Um, you know, I happened to see a casino where people were pulling slot machine things. They had a desire to get rich quick. They have, you know, so he's saying church members, they heard the word, they got baptized, they were in the church, they were, they, they were called, they were becoming elect, they were fruitful for a time. And then he says, the desires for other things entering in choke the word out of them and they become unfruitful, which means they don't go into the first resurrection. So, so church members, if they're not diligent and if they're not watching and if they're not careful, they can turn away. And I'll bet most of you could write three or four names on a piece of paper of church members who turned away from God's way of doing things. In John 15, 2, we see that unfruitful servants are cast away. And this is pretty scary stuff, but it's a warning. It's a pep talk from Jesus. Be faithful unto death is what he's telling us. John 15, 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, my father, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, my father, he prunes that they may bear more fruit. God is interested in us bearing more fruit day after day, week after week, year after year, however long we are alive until our last breath. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they throw them in the fire and they are burned. That's church members, if they don't stay fruitful. So the pep talk is, whatever you do, stay fruitful. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, let no one deceive you by any means, which is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said, for the day will not come unless there's a falling away first. And you could say, well, it already happened. Well, but there were no miraculous lying wonders then. Yes, there was a falling away, but the great deceptive lying wonders hasn't started yet, right? And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Jesus sets us a goal of being fruitful and faithful and wise. Matthew 24, 45. Who then is that faithful and wise servant? Matthew 24, 46. Blessed, extremely well off, super enriched, blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Now, all three major pep talks that Jesus has given, one's in Luke 12, one's in Mark, Luke, and Matthew 24, and they all kind of run parallel with each other. And then the final pep talk that Jesus gave was in John 15, 16, and so on, right? All three of these pep talks point towards being ready faithful, fruitful, and so doing. So by focusing on pep talk number one, we see the highlights of Luke chapter 12, which is really fascinating because it's like a year before Matthew 12, 24 is written. So these same thoughts that you see in Matthew 24 were in Jesus' mind like a year ahead. And it's almost as if he was, he was you know, ruminating on them and formulating how he would give that final three days before he dies, Matthew 24, you know, pep talk. But back in Luke 12, 21, he says, so, he, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, the average person without God's help, without God's inspiration and guidance, what are they doing all day long every day? They're trying to lay up treasure for themselves. They're trying to benefit themselves. They're trying to keep themselves healthy. They're trying to earn enough money to live better than they did last year and so on. Humans, unless overridden with godly practices, fall into this, you know, follow the normal routine that most people follow. In Luke 12, 31, seek the kingdom of God, said Jesus, and all these other things will be yours at some time, you know, in the future when it's appropriate. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And God wants your heart. He doesn't want your lip service. He doesn't want, you, you know, people singing. He doesn't want people talking about Jesus. He wants a heart after Jesus like King David had a heart after God. So at this point, Christ begins with a ready waiting theme and progresses to the unknown hour is coming of Jesus. 
in Luke 12, 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Okay, that's 2,000-year-old language. Did you get up this morning and gird your waist and light your lamps? What, how do we say that in the 21st century? What's, what's the modern understanding of waist girded and lamps burning? What is that? Loud? Get dressed and flip the light on. Get dressed and flip the light on. Okay. Anybody else? Be, be ready. Get organized. You know, if you're going to be, if you're going to play in the Super Bowl, what are you going to do a half an hour, an hour before Super Bowl? What are you going to do? <coughs> you're going to get girded, right? And you're going to get revved up. And when they say go, you come running out of the locker room like you're going to conquer the world. Right, and I think that's I think that's the idea, you know. Um, so the you know the gird your waist and let your lamps be burning. It's like it gets a little lost in 2,000 years. Luke 12:36, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. Now, when the master returns from the wedding, in most cases in the scriptures, he's bringing his bride back home with him. Right? And so it says, and when he comes and knocks on the door, that they may open to him immediately. Now, if you're the master of the house and the servants are inside the door somewhere and you've made this journey and you and your wife get off your donkeys or whatever and you walk up to the door and you knock at the door any time, night or day, you expect that door to come open really fast? He does. He sets this stage. And he says, you know, um, blessed, this is verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find them watching. And you know, if you watch the, the president yesterday or the day before, <clears throat> when he was about to get in or out of one of those black suburbans, there was a security guy holding the top of the door and the side of the door, and there was no way that door was going to move any which way while the president got in or out. That man's job at that moment was secure the door, keep it open. Right? And that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. His servants need to be ready at a moment's notice to open the door to Jesus. Right? So... Being ready in an instant to greet the master is the point. In uh, verse 37, he says, Blessed are those servants whom are like this, and when the master comes, find them watching for him to return. Verse 38, If he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so watching and ready, blessed are those servants. And that's what he's saying in these pep talks. He's saying, My faithful servants my faithful, fruitful servants who are watching and ready at all times will be magnificently blessed. Mark expands on this scripture in Mark 13, 35. Watch therefore, because you do not know the hour the master of the house is coming. And then the Romans had four watches in the night. It says coming in the evening, that's the first watch. At midnight, that's the second watch. At the crowing of the rooster, that's the third watch. And in the morning, that's the fourth watch. And so in verse 36, he says, Lest coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. A Roman soldier who fell asleep on his watch was doomed to death in many cases. His job was to stay vigilant and stay alert, and that's why Jesus and Paul and others borrow from it. And so he says, what I say, verse 37, what I say to you in front of me, I say to all, well, who's that? That's all faithful servants for the next 2,000 years of history. He says, I say, watch. Now, that next, this pep talk mentions the thief in the night and <clears throat> Luke 12, 39. But know this, the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come. He would have watched and been on guard and he would not have allowed his house to be broken into and the thief wouldn't have ripped him off. What's the point? The thief comes unexpectedly. 
You don't know if he's coming tonight or tomorrow night or the next night. You don't know if he's coming uh, 10 or 11 or 12 and 1 or 1 and 2 or 3 and 4. You don't know when he's coming. He comes unexpectedly and you're not prepared and he steals and he's gone and he rips you off. And if you knew what time he was coming, you'd be there ready to catch him and he wouldn't rip you off. Right? So he would have watched, he would have been on guard and not allowed his house to be broken into. So what's the point? The thief comes unexpectedly. Verse 40 of Luke 12. Therefore, says Jesus, you also be ready, watching, watching every day in readiness to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this, this event affected me tremendously. I was at the Feast of Tabernacles, I think a year, two years, a year and a half ago. Anyhow, no, a year and, well, now, not this year, but the year before. And a good friend of mine that I'd known many years ago, Frank, Frank Sherrick, I heard that he'd been walking on the seawall in Galveston on the, in the Feast of Tabernacles with his dog. And his dog got loose and ran out between parked cars into the road, which is a very busy road. And Frank, for a couple of seconds, just said, I've got to save my dog, ran out in front of the road, and the car hit him at like 40 miles an hour. And that was his last day. That was the day he met Jesus, right? In the sense that you go to sleep, spirit, you know, your consciousness stops, right? Which is what happens when you finally fall asleep at night on the pillow. Your consciousness stops. And then when you wake up next, unless you've got a clock looking at you, you don't know how long you've been asleep. So your next instant of consciousness, you have no idea of the passage of time. And that's what happens in death. The, when you lose consciousness in death, to you, you will see Christ's face one second later. It'll be years that pass for many, but in your consciousness, when your eyes come awake again, there will be the face of Jesus. You know, so he's saying, be ready, because you don't know when I'm coming to you and that's been true for 99.99% of all faithful Jesus servants for the last 2,000 years, they came you know, unexpectedly. Frank got out of bed that morning. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. He was in Galveston, Texas at the beach. It was a wonderful day to rejoice and praise God. And suddenly, without warning, without realizing, the dog got loose. And the next second, instead of saying, wait, I mustn't run out into traffic, he just rushed out into traffic. That was his last day. He didn't know the day or the hour that that was coming. And that was the end of Frank. And when Frank comes awake, he'll see the face of God. And I take that as a typical example of people I have known. Chester didn't know the day or the hour he would die. Uh, my wife didn't know the day or the hour she would die. You know. We, but we all get up in the morning and we go, well, I've got another 24 hours or more. But we don't know this could be our last day. You don't know. So he's saying, be ready at all times. Um, so Jesus is, <coughs> urges us all to be answering this next question often, which is um, Luke 12, 42. Who then is that faithful and wise servant? And blessed is that servant when his master comes will find him so doing. So the point of Bible study, which I, I didn't understand 40 years ago when I first came to the church, the point of Bible study is to help you be ready at the beginning of the day, mentally primed and excited about what God is doing in the world and in your life. And if you died at noon or sunset or midnight that day, your heart and your mind was in God's word and you were doing as faithful as you could possibly be and blessed is that servant who's his master when he fi comes, finds him so doing. So more than 12 months later, but three days before Jesus dies, this Matthew, Mark, Luke, the Matthew 24, 25, is weighing heavy on his mind. This is the big pep talk, right? There are 66 verses of explanation on how we must be acting in order to qualify to be found so doing. And this pep talk 
is equally valid for <coughs> saints who die before the tribulation, of which 99.999% will, right, roughly, right, <coughs> and equally valid for those who die in the tribulation, because, again, you won't know the day or the hour, and it's equally valid for those who are alive, because even though you might be watching the two witnesses' dead bodies lying in the streets for three and a half days, you still won't know precisely which 24-hour day it is that you will look up and see the face of Jesus coming down on a white horse. So when he says you won't know the day or the hour, it's true for all 100% of all kinds of faithful servants. They won't know, right? Um, Matthew 24, 42. Watch, be vigilant, therefore, because you don't know the hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master had watched, the, the hour the thief would come, he would have known, he would have watched. So he uses this thief story again. Verse 44. How, therefore, you also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect, which was absolutely true for Thalia, for Frank Sherrick, for Chester, and we could probably go around the room and name a whole bunch of people who didn't know the hour. Now, if you're a criminal and they say you're going to be executed at midnight, okay, you know the day and the hour. But, but he's talking to vast numbers of church members who won't know, so be ready every day sort of thing. Um, blessed is that servant his master will find you know, whenever he comes and finds that person so doing. So Jesus gives us the pep talk to urge us to be the best we can be every day with the caution that this could be the day. And most of us, we don't think that, you know, especially when we're young. Young people go, I've got 40, 50, 60 years, you know, but that's not a guarantee. You don't know for sure. So we need to know that any day could be our last day. So we need to be ready. So doing every day, those who live into the tribulation will face the most powerful supercharged deception imaginal on planet earth and <clears throat> essentially it's the tribulation is only three and a half years long and we've already lived these yay many years we've lived right and to throw our church attendance and faithfulness away to save our lives for less than three and a half years in the tribulation is such a shame and a terrible thing. And Jesus said, are you willing to die for my sake? You know, and in the tribulation, a lot of people will be tested. Will you or will you not die for Jesus and his sake? So victory over the deception tsunami that is coming. Right? We're told it's coming. We can't see it yet. Fire is not being called down from heaven. We don't know who the false prophet is by name. We don't know who the beast is by name. But when it kicks in, it's going to be like a 20-foot tsunami wave of deception washing over all of planet Earth. And we will be hated of all nations because if we stay faithful, we're going to say that is not Christ. Christ will come on a white horse in the sky I will not worship and I will not accept the beast power and the 666 and the mark of the beast and all that. So victory over deception, uh, the tsunami deception lies in learning and living more truth and being faithful to that truth day after day after day until our last day and hour comes and we don't know when that is.